Okay, uh, it's great to have you back. The, um, the overarching topic of this course, uh, we're, what we're aiming for, are Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So it would make sense that we take a look at Markov chains first, because um, well, I haven't had much experience with Markov chains in my in my courses before that. So it's always good to um, look at that closer. Markov chains are um, defined very easily. A Markov chain is just as Oops, I just, okay, I just crashed. Are you still here? Yes, we yes, um, yeah. For some reason, my Zoom just crashed. Okay, <laughs> no. okay. So uh, a Markov chain is a sequence of random variables. Uh, so, sorry, Philip, I, I don't yes. see your I don't screen. I you don't see the screen, okay. Um, share this again, okay. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Okay, so um, we have a sequence of random variables and a sequence of random variables being a Markov chain means that the dependency structure is very simple. So in, in principle, if you have a lot of random variables, let's say those are x1 and x2 and x3 and so on, then in principle, they could depend on each other in very complicated ways. So they might be uh, correlated like that and that. And so there's a whole um, theory of how random variables can live on such a graph structure in the sense that you know, x1 is kind of like uh, a primal variable and then x2 is dependent on that and x3 is all dependent on that and other variables and so on. But Markov chains are a lot easier than that because the graph, even if, you know, you haven't thought about random variables on a graph before, should have this picture in mind. There's a first element, and then all the, the um, following elements only depend on their predecessor. So what this means is, if we want to look at the distribution of some x n plus one, so we want to, but this is, um, of course, this is supposed to signify a density if x n plus one is continuous or it's discrete if this is a discrete variable. So if you want to look at the distribution of xn plus one, even if we have all the information of all the predecessors, we can just you know drop all those terms and it's only interesting, sorry, not, not those terms, um, all those terms, and it's only necessary to keep the information of the last state. So it's kind of a um, one memory sequence. So the, the predecessor, um, is, is important in order to know the distribution of, of the next element, but not the ones before that. Um, a, a good intuition for that gives the, the game of snakes and ladders, which you might have played in your childhood or maybe even still, <laughs> um, which works like this. Um, you have a figurine somewhere, let's say, I don't know, maybe up here, and then you throw a die and depending on the number on the die, you, you take steps like that. So one, um, throwing a one with, this is what with probability one sixth, you, you land here. Uh, with one sixth, you, you land here and so on. And if you reach such, um, such a tile here, you can climb up the ladder so you actually land here. So given, given this, this position here, you have a probability distribution of next tiles on which you could land. So with probability one sixth, you land here or here or here or here or here. Yeah. If you land on a snake, you slide down the tail on you, you land down there. So um, as you can see, it's not important how you got here. So it doesn't matter whether you were here and then jumped here or whether you, you were here and then jumped here. This is not important at all. It's only in interesting to know where you are right now and that this determines the probability distribution of your next tile. So it's not deterministic, but you know, it, well, it's certainly dependent on your current, current step. And a counter example for a Markov chain is, uh, let's say you have an urn like this, full of colored balls and you remove all balls, ball by ball and put them in this other urn. So 
in, in this case, you can't forget what you've done so far. So if you have removed all the red balls, the probability of the next ball being red is zero. So it certainly depends not only on the last ball you removed, but you know, on you have to keep all the memory. So if X n is the color of the nth ball, then this is this is not a Markov chain. Okay, so um, this definition you should read as even if you have all the information, you only have to keep that because all the previous steps are irrelevant. That is a Markov chain. So that's a, a purely probabilistic concept. And so far, this has nothing to do with sampling whatsoever, but we will see some interesting things about Markov chains, which will facilitate us to construct a sampling method. And again, yeah, just, just stop me whenever I'm explaining something not well. Now, there are two main versions of Markov chains. <clears throat> First version being the Markov chain defined on a finite state space. So you could think of the Markov chain being um, a frog. So I, I, I can't draw a frog. I will just draw a stick figure. <laughs> Let's say this is a frog. And this, this frog jumps um, between water ladies on a pond, right? So there's a finitely many or let's say discrete uh, states and um, the, the current position of the frog determines what other water lily pads are possible to reach. So that's a finite state space and the Markov chain walks over this finite state space. So we have uh, every sequence element is in some set M where M can be labeled from one to K. And then we can summarize all the information about the Markov chain by such a transition matrix. And this transition matrix keeps track of the transition probabilities. If you are on lily pad number i, what's the probability that you can jump to lily pad number j? And this is recorded like this. And you have to be a bit careful to how to read this. So I'd like to read this as the probability from i to j, because this is exactly what this, what this says. If you are at i on at time n, then you jump with this probability in the next step to the leap at number j. Um, OK. So I, the order is you know, the other way around, but this way it's, in, in my uh, experience, easier to read. And then there are continuous or general state space uh, Markov chains, then you could think of a continuum and you, you are somewhere in the state xn. And then you just you know, jump anywhere. I don't know, you could jump here or here or here. You could jump on any point on the continuum. And then of course you need something which is a probability transition measure and which generalizes this transition matrix. And this is called the transition kernel which is defined as so you have a point here because you are at some fixed position on at, at time n. But the other argument is a set, a measurable set. And this depicts the probability that you jump from x you know, in some set a. This is the probability. And you can also construct a density from that. So this is. Um, an integral over some density. I don't have any good notation for that right now. So it's, let's say, the rho x of y d d y, something like that. So you can write this as either as a measure or as a density, a transition density. Now, obviously, this is a lot more complicated than the finite state space, but um, they are quite the same. It's just easier to draw pictures in the finite state space case. Let's think about a concrete example for a finite state space Markov chain. You know, we talk about the frog, but let's do something a lot easier. This is um, a very simplistic weather model from Wikipedia. You have two states, sunny and rainy, and with probability 90%, a sunny day follows a sunny day, and with probability 10%, a rainy day follows a sunny day. And you know, on a rainy day with equal probabilities, you will have a rainy day or a sunny day on the next day. So of course, this is not a, a 
really good model, but it's a good model for a Markov chain. Then the transition matrix is this. So you have to be a bit careful with what's row and column numbering, of course, but you, know, you can believe me that this is the correct way to, to number them in our notation. And um, so you see given state one, so given state sunny, you stay at sunny with 90% or you change the state to two, which is rainy with 10%. And you know, same, same thing for rainy days. This uh, such a matrix P, such a transition matrix has a few important properties. The first being that they are a stochastic matrix in the sense that if you multiply the one vector, so this is what is meant by this symbol, is the one vector. If you multiply this from the right to the matrix P, then you get the one ve vector out because the sum of all the um, rows is again one. And if you multiply from the right with P or you know, from the left with a vector, then this P models the propagation of probabilities. So if we take the, um, the, vector, the vector one zero, which you could think of as being a sunny day because it's 100% you know, sunny and 0% rainy, then you get out the correct um, transition probability for such a day. So with 90%, uh, is it still a sunny day or 10% is a rain day? And this also works for mixed states. So if you start with, so you can either think of this being a single day where you think with 30% probability that it's sunny and with 70% probability that it's rainy. So you have, um, um, you have some idea about the current day's weather, but you're not entirely sure because you're, I don't know, maybe closed in in some house. Then multiplication by P, again propagates the probabilities in the right way so either with 30 percent probability it's it's sunny today then with 0 0.3 times 0 0.9 it will stay sunny or it is rainy today and it will change with probability one half so you know this is the correct sum of probabilities which will lead to a sunny day tomorrow even if you're unsure about the current weather today and you only have you know such a probability here and similarly for um, rain tomorrow. So multiplying by P corresponds to one time step um, evolution, if you want to say that, of the probabilities. So you can multiply by P again, P again, P again. Then this is kind of a, a three day or four day weather forecast given the current setting. And there is often an interesting vector which is invariant with respect to multiplication from the right. And this is called an invariant vector under P. So you could plug in those numbers, 5 6 and 1 6, multiply this from the right with P, and you would get pi out again. And uh, why does this make sense? So I won't write fractions here because it's easier to think about you know, uh, integer days instead of fraction days. So let's say we have. 50 sunny days here and 10 rainy days here, then, okay, you know that 90% of those sunny days in average will stay sunny. So what's 90% of 50? That's 45. 45 sunny days, so this, this goes here and um, ten percent, which is five, become rainy days. Uh, sorry, five. And looking at those rainy days, if you take half of those, which is five, those are again sunny days, and five of them, which is half, stay rainy days. So as you can see, the total amount of sunny and rainy days in average stays the same. This is why this is an invariant ve vector. So you would usually write this as, you know, five sixth and one sixth in order to have a vector which is a probability vector, but you know, it makes sense to look at this in this way. So an invariant vector doesn't mean that nothing changes. So there's a lot of change here. You know, those those days, sorry, those uh, weathers change their their, um, their state here, but the ensemble um, of states keeps the same shape. 
And this is why this is called an invariant vector. Not because nothing moves, because there is a lot of um, moving things here, but because the ensemble does not change. OK. And what else can we do with the Markov chain? One thing is you could start with a sunny day and then just simulate the Markov chain. So you could let time progress and just look whether it's rainy or sunny today. So as you can see, we started with sunny and it stayed sunny for one more day. Then it became rain day, then it jumped back to sunny and maybe I don't know, a few days of sunny, maybe three or four or five, I don't know. And then you know, you know, rainy day, long sunny period, you know, up and down of weather. And what you can do is, is you could then make a histogram and count all the sunny days and all the rainy days. <clears throat> and if you look at the numbers, then they are quite close to five sixths and one sixth of the total number of days, which is 1000. It's not completely correct, of course, because you know, there is some fluctuation. And, uh, but in the long run, you will see that this histogram converges to this invariant vector. And this is one of the most important observations about Markov chains, that there usually is, not always, but there usually is something like an invariant vector. And it, this invariant vector is an attractor in some sense. Um, and in, in the sense that if you run the Markov chain, then the empirical, well, or taking all the data converges to this, to this distribution. There are also other ways in which this is an attractor. So you could also start with not a single day or with a single state and then simulate and do such a histogram. So what you also could do is you start with a distribution. Well, I think that's what I'm going to do next because it's a bit harder to explain. OK, so let's drop this for a second. Um, a different thing which is interesting is so-called detailed balance, which is the following notion. We, we call a Markov chain on a finite state space pi reversible if two conditions are fulfilled. First one being that pi is an invariant probability vector. So for example, this five sixth and one sixth example for the, for the weather dynamics. And secondly, something which is called the detailed balance condition is fulfilled. And um, this can be made intuitive if we look at, for example, this graph. So what is, let's say i is 1 and j is 2, just for example. And this means that pi 1 times p 1, 2 is the same as pi 2, p 2, 1. Um, this is, so pi one is, you could say, the current mass living on pi one. So there might be, so if you, those are sunny days, rainy days, and snowy days, then you have, might, might have an ensemble of 10, rainy, 10, 10 sunny days, 15 rainy days, and five snowy days, or something like that. So pi one is kind of the fraction of mass which currently lives on this, in this space, uh, sorry, in this state one. And pi one times p one two is the mass which was here and jumps over to stage two. So this is kind of the influx from one to two. This is just the you could say the reaction rate, but multiplied by pi, pi one. Sorry, by p yeah by pi one by, by, by pi one. This is the current well the actual mass influx or the I don't know, depends on the metaphor you're using so let's say the mass influx from one to two and similarly this is the influx from two to one and if those are equal then this means that at least those two nodes are in some kind of balance because the same amount of mass goes from one to two and the same as it goes from two to one and if this holds for all pairs of i and j, this means that um, just as with this example here, um, equally many sunny days become rainy days as rainy days become sunny days. So this means that there is no change in the ensemble 
although still, of course, individual particles move between states. Right. So this is called a detailed balance condition because this is well, this is what's happening. There's a balance between all the nodes, all pairwise nodes. This is an interesting property to have. Now, if you have detailed balance, then you already know that pi is an invariant vector. So we could drop this and just look at this property. And we can derive that pi is an invariant vector for, for this Markov chain. And this we can, we can compute um, explicitly. So what we have to prove is that pi times p is the same thing as pi, of course. So what is, um, let's look at the jth entry of, of pi p. This is by the definition of matrix vector multiplication, the same as pi um, i times p i j one to n. Now the detailed balance condition gives us that we can change the indices here, which is pi j times p j i. Now we can, you know, pull this out here. And we saw that summing over all the columns in one specific row j sums to one. So this is one. So this is just pi j, which is the jth entry of pi. So element-wise, those are identical. So those are identical objects. So if we have detailed balance condition, then pi is an invariant vector, but not the other way around. So there are invariant probability vectors which don't fulfill detailed balance condition. So for example, if we remove all the, remove that and that and that, and we can also remove those here, you know, then all that's happening here is a kind of circular motion. Let's say those probabilities are always one, then you can see that your mass just periodically circles around uh, those state spaces here. You definitely have no detailed balance condition because you know you have no flux from two to one. But the one third, one third, one third state space, uh, so this this here is still an invariant probability vector, right? Because you know nothing nothing really changes here. So this is a stronger notion than invariance, but we will usually lose, use this detailed balance condition because it's an interesting property to have. Okay. Um, that was finite state, um, Monte Carlo, sorry, Markov chains. Are there any questions to that topic? And just uh, just a uh, remark, Philip. Yes, please. So basically, we cannot have detailed balance, for instance, in case we have a directed graph. Yes. Um, it, it's a counterexample, right? Um, you, you can have a directed graph, um, for example, with two nodes, if you have you know two directed nodes which go back and forth. In that ah, okay. Case, you can still have. If there are three, okay, so only with two nodes. But if you have Three, then no, right? Yeah, you, you would have to have, you know, something like that. But then you not really have a directed graph. So I guess you're right. So if you have a directed graph, then it's hard to obtain the detailed balance condition. Okay. But it's, it's always a directed graph. So you, you can't really have an undirected graph because they're always certain uh, Sorry, um, not directed, um, not symmetric. Yeah. I mean, I can go from one. Yeah. I can go from one edge to the other one, but not the other way around. Yeah, that, that's probably the case. If you have, yeah, definitely. So if you have um, one, one transition, which is positive, so this is a non-zero number, mm -hmm. the other is zero, then you know, the only way to yeah. have this condition is this being zero, so this means that this node doesn't play any role, mm. which is nonsensical, right? So I guess you're right. So you only you know, you always have to have kind of symmetrical um, jumps back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. 
I'm sorry, I also have a question. Yes, please. Um, if, uh, let's say, you have a sampling of all these random variables, can you still assume that the sampling is identical, it, uh, independent distributed? No. no, 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 not at all. That's, that's exactly one problem that we will have. It's not a big problem, but um, if you, let's go back to this um, slide because there the picture is still intact. So if you walk through this Markov chain, then of course, successors depend on each other because that, that's how a Markov chain works. So if you have some state here and you're, you're here, then the next element will depend on the previous element. So um, adjacent elements depend on each other and you know, by extension, they also depend on the ones before them. So you have a dependent sequence of random numbers and only by waiting a long time between samples, you have, let's say, almost uh, independence. Between uh, okay, them. I see, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so general state space Markov chains um, work similarly, but no, everything is continuous. So one example that we could look at, it's a completely artificial example that I thought of. So th this is a transition kernel. And this specification says that if you are at point X, let's say here at X1, then in average you jump to X half and there is some spread which is which depends on the current position. So if you're here, then you jump somewhere according to this density. If you're further out, then the variance is smaller, so you jump closer to X, X half. So you can you could think of, well, you, you jump somewhere here, maybe here, and then you have another distribution like that. You know. So this, this gives you a, a walk on this continuous state space on the whole real line. In zero, you like to stay centered around zero, but you have quite a high variance, so you will jump out of the, the zero point eventually. Um, in the general state space case, you have similar properties. If you integrate over the second argument, you get one. This is just because this is a probability kernel. So you have to jump somewhere, of course. If you do something similar to right multiplication, which of course now is an integral. So you integrate, you could say this is a current state density. So this means you're not entirely sure where you are. You have, you have some probability distribution where you currently are. And if you integrate the transition kernel with respect to this current state density new, then this gives you the new density where you will, so we could say this is new n, this is new n plus one. So this is a new density where you will likely be after one step. And again, if you do this multiple times, you get um, a forecast for yeah, arbitrary many steps in advance. And again, there's something called an invariant measure now or an invariant density, which is a fixed point with respect to the application of this operator here. So this is a new, this is not invariant. So I maybe shouldn't write let's say new tilde. This is application of this density one time. So you see how um, applying this operator changes the density to something which is more concentrated around zero. And there will be a density, or well, this is not, you yes, have to prove, but usually there will be some density which, um, which is invariant with respect to application of this operator P from the right. And this is then called the invariant density. Similar to the finite state space case, we can just start at some point and simulate the Markov chain. So there are a few interesting things to see about this specific Markov chain. So this is still, you know, uh, this, this example, we try to go back to the origin, but there is some, some spread which depends on our current state. As you can see, you have 
only rarely excursions outside of, let's say, minus two, two. It's really hard to get out of this box. And you can still, you can again do a histogram and you get something like that. And this is a completely non-trivial function. I don't have a closed form solution for that. Um, this is not a Gaussian, it's way too flat here and the tails are much more rapidly decreasing than for a Gaussian function. So this is a non-trivial function. And this, well, this we would have to prove, but this is probably the, the invariant measure. Okay. So again, we can try to compute the invariant measure by starting somewhere and running the Markov chain for a long time. When there, um, there's again this, this notion of having a detailed balance condition, but now in the continuous case, I can't draw this picture with single nodes because you know, we, have, we have densities here. Um, it's hard to visualize that. So please visualize this in your mind with the finite state space case. So this is, um, mu is your current, current state measure. So you're again, not sure where you are specifically, but you have a distribution of mass currently. And if the amount of mass that goes from U to V, but you know, in a density sense, is the same as the mass from U to U, then this Markov chain is in detailed balance. And again, this implies invariance of this measure, which is proven similarly in the discrete case. And the, the main thing to take away from both the finite state space case and the general state space case is that under certain assumptions, which are usually fulfilled if you don't do things wrong, then a Markov chain has a unique invariant distribution pi. And running this Markov chain and you know, making histogram of the visited spaces recovers this uh, distribution, this invariant distribution computationally, you know, in the long run. So now we see that a Markov chain generates samples from pi. And this is basically what we want. We want to have some generator for um, samples from a measure. Now the problem of course is, usually we start with that, so this is given, and how could we possibly construct a Markov chain such that the invariant density is equal to the given measure? That is, that is a challenge, right? So given a measure mu, how do we construct a Markov chain such that this mu is its invariant distribution? Then we can simulate the Markov chain, and then we get, you know, again, dependent samples as you, as you said, but this will be only a minor problem. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Otherwise, I will um, we go look at the next set of slides. Oh, this is big. This is big. Okay, uh, this will be very short. We will talk about convergence of Markov chains. This will be short because I don't know much about that. Um, but we will try to get some intuition. So one, one problem with Markov chains arises when they are periodic. So as you can see, uh, all mass from st uh, currently sitting in one will move to two and all mass certainly sitting in two will jump to one. So that means that this chain's periodic, or if you apply the operator, so this should be actually application from the right, sorry. Um, this uh, is you know, two periodic, so nothing changes really. So this is problematic. It's, it's not pro problematic for if we do something like st starting somewhere and then you know, running and collecting samples in the histogram, but certainly, I should write this, this, this will not converge. You know? 
because it's it's periodic. Um, sometimes you're interested in an, in this quantity also, which is a more stronger form of convergence than just this. You could say this is a kind of a C sorrow sum if you want. Um, this will still be fine, but you know things are problematic in this this type of convergence. So you don't want the chain to be periodic. You like it to be so it will usually suffice to have one loop here to uh, change up things a bit. You can also have something here, of course, and then the the chain will be nicer. Just just remember that periodic chains are a bit um, they're not chaotic enough, you could say. And the second problem is if the the Markov chain. So this is one Markov chain, but it obviously separates into two parts. So you can't move from one to three or to four ever. So that means that there is a unique, there's not unique invariant density because, but for example, if those are all nice numbers like, whoops, what's happening? Oh crap. <laughs> um, it crashed. So I have to start it again. The annotations are lost, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay. Uh, you still here? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so, so why is this a problem? Um, if let's say those numbers are all nice, so this is one you half. You still need to share the screen. Oh, so. yes, yes. I always forget to do that. Okay. So if those numbers are nice, uh, let's say this is one half and one half, one half, one half, then you can guess that the invariant density of this section here is the vector one half and one half. Running this this part of the Markov chain will not change this vector, and similarly here. But in terms of what is an invariant vector now with four elements, you could you can do whatever you want. So you could either do one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, or one fourth, of course. So this is an invariant vector, but you can also do something like. Um, uh, one or I don't know, so something um should have prepared some numbers for that. I have to do this. Okay, one one eighth and one eighth and also three eighths and three eighths. So this is also invariant. Yeah. This this stays the same in its its section here, and this stays the same in its section here. So this is also an invariant vector. So you don't have a unique invariant density, so this means you don't actually know what you're converging to. And it will depend well. If you start, for example, with state one and you run the Markov chain, then the invariant density we will converge to is one half, one half, and two zeros here. So this is this is problematic. You don't want to uh, want to have your Markov chain to be separable. So you know one two things. The Markov chain should be irreducible in the sense that you can go from anywhere to anywhere eventually, and it should be aperiodic so you don't get trapped in some some cycles. So you can, if you're familiar with ergodic theory, there's you know very very strong connection between those two things, and um, the property which we're looking for is called ergodicity. So if a Markov chain is ergodic, for example, geometrically ergodic or uniformly ergodic, then things are nice. But you know this is this is beyond the scope of this course. I just want to take away from this that you want irreducibility and a periodicity, and then we're usually fine. Okay. Um, then we can finally think about sampling via this method. So again, we have found a way of sampling from, from some measure by constructing a Markov chain. And then we know that under some suitable conditions that samples will form a histogram which approximates the Markov chain's invariant density. 
The problem is that we can't choose the invariant density because it's, you know, it's it's a property of the Markov chain. So we have to construct a Markov chain which samples from the exact right measure. And Markov chain Monte Carlo methods do this. So this is a method of constructing a Markov chain which exactly has invariant density identical to the measure we want to sample from. So I hope this was not too convoluted way of saying this. Um, right. So how can we do that? that that's the that's a big problem here. And this is why we needed rejection sampling, because we start by sampling proposals from a wrong Markov chain. So this Markov chain has the wrong invariant density, but it's easy to implement in the sense that we can sample efficiently from this, let's say, proposal Markov chain. Then we add an accept reject step, just as we did with rejection sampling. So we decide whether we want to keep the sample or don't want to keep it. And then there's a slight modification of the uh, rejection, sorry, the rejection sampling algorithm. Either we accept the proposal, then we use it in the list of samples. And if it's rejected, then we don't throw it away. Well, we, we throw away the proposal, but we take the previous sample again and copy it in this list of samples. So this um, means that this method will always get us n samples if we run the code n times. Now, obviously, they are strongly dependent because they, they often are identical to the previous sample. But um, for performance, this is not a big problem. And the big idea here is that this accept and reject step changes the invariant density of you know, the combined Markov chain. So there's, there's some proposal Markov chain here. And by adding this accept reject step, we modify this Markov chain in, in a slight way. And the interesting thing is that this um, allows us to shape the invariant distribution to be identical to the one we want to sample from. And that I think is almost magic that this, this works. That means that in this way, we construct a Markov chain, which has the correct invariant density. And that means that, you know, if things are nice, so if you have a periodicity and um, separability, non-separability, then the samples will converge to the invariant density. The, the easiest thing we can do, and we will stick with that easy case is the following. So we first need to define a proposal Markov chain. Uh, I will write this with Q, not, not P because this will be our final Markov chain. So the probability that we go from X in some set A is given by the transition kernel from X to A. And we will also use its density form. So we can evaluate this. Well, this is a probability measure for fixed X. So it means it has density usually. This density we will call small q of x and y. If you integrate that, um, then we get this transition kernel. And one easy example is not the, you know, we had contrived examples from uh, two, two slides of slides before where we had this pull, push back to the origin, but something much easier is if you are at x, just jump somewhere close to it. So let's say we are here. Then the transition density looks like that. So I'm drawing the density you know, to the right. Let me jump to that point. You know, again, if you're here, you, this density looks like that. You jump somewhere, you know, you have a sequence of densities like that. And this constructs this random walk. So this is this will lead to something which is a random walk Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, where this transition density is a Gaussian distribution with mean of the current state and a small variance such that we stay close to where we are currently. You know, this Markov chain is the wrong Markov chain. So this doesn't sample from a given measure mu that we start with. So this is always in the background. This is something that we want to have. It might be the 
posterior measure of some Bayesian inverse problem, or it could be um, the if you do if you're starting with statistical mechanics, this might be the equilibrium distribution of particles in the gas or something like that. So this is something that you start with. Now we just constructed a random walk Markov chain and it's nothing to do with this mu whatsoever. So we still need to modify that. And this accept reject step happens here. So this is our mu that we start with and we assume that it has density rho. And let's say that xn is the previous sample. So we have accepted that already. This is in our box or this could also be the the, set, the, um, the state we start with. Then we generate a proposal from our proposal Markov chain. So for example, a random walk. So Wn will be you know, close to Xn with small variance. And we say that the transition kernel is, is given by Q of Xn dot. And then we define this quantity alpha. And we define this as this slightly complicated looking number. So it's a minimum of this, you know, you could say anti-symmetric product. And it's easier to, to think about this if the proposal Markov chain has a symmetric kernel. So in the random walk, this is symmetric. You know, if you are at Xn, this is Q of xn dot, so this is the, the random walk um, example. This is symmetric in the sense that um, if we swap places, then the density is, is identical here. So if we look at this point, y, then this number here is the same as if we center this around this here, this number, right? So Q of UV is the same as Q of VU. If that is the case, then this becomes a bit easier. And this number is the minimum of one and the ratio of rho of WN and rho of XN. Now, what is, what is rho again? This is the density of the target measure. So what is this? This is one if rho of WN is larger or equal to rho of xn. So what does this mean? Rho is the density of the target measure. And we usually want to improve our, our density of the target measure because what, what does sampling do? Let's say this is, this is um, the density of the measure we want to sample from. They want to have a lot of samples where the density is high and only few of them where the density is small, right? So you know, in, in average, or usually we want to have samples which have high density rho. We don't want to have only the point with highest density because that's, you know, that's op optimization. We don't, we don't want to do optimization, but we want to have samples which usually are typically high with respect to rho. And this is what happens here. So if our proposal is better, than our previous sample, then this number is one, and it's less than one if the proposal is worse than our current sample, in the sense that it decreases the, the density um, in this point. Now, again, we, want, we don't want to do optimization, so we don't want to walk uphill all the time. So this is why this will be important. And this alpha number is used in the following sense. Um, so this we already talked about. Um, alpha is equal to one if the proposal is better or more likely in terms of the density, and it's between zero and one if the proposal is less likely. And this accept reject step works like this. Um, we, we got our proposal Wn, and we accept this proposal with probability given by that. So that means we always accept proposals which improve our density. And we sometimes accept proposals which make our density worse. If we 
would set this alpha to zero if the proposal is worse than the current sample, we would do optimization. So this would be kind of a, a random walk optimization method where you, you know, don't look at the gradient or something like that. You just jump somewhere and look if you're getting better or worse. Then you know, this is random walk optimization method. But if you allow the, um, the samples to decrease the density again with some probability, then you also can walk down again from, from those peaks. And as an algorithm, which you could Im implement in MATLAB or Python, you start with the density of this target measure mu. You have chosen some kernel density Q, this is your, your proposal, Markov chain kernel density. And I will just write that you have some sample generator for this, for this proposal, Markov chain. You want to have n samples and you start at some, some initial state x0, and then you will obtain a sequence of samples like that from mu. It works like this. You first generate a proposal from this proposal Markov chain, then you compute this acceptance probability, and then you do the same trick that we did with uh, rejection sampling. So how do we accept this with probability alpha? We, we build a uniform number, sorry, a number which is distributed according to a uniform distribution of zero one. And if u is less or equal than alpha, then we accept the proposal. And else, if we don't accept it, <clears throat> then we use the previous sample as a new sample again. And so why should this work? Yeah. It, it looks plausible a bit to allow this, so to always use better samples and sometimes walk down if you have a worse sample or a worse proposal. So it makes kind of sense, but why this should exactly recover the correct measure as the Markov chain's invariant density is, um, well, at least for me at this point, completely unclear. But we will first look at some, um, some simulations. Now in this case, we want to sample from a measure which, which looks like this. So this is the density of, of, um, of mu. Um, it's zero everywhere, but between zero and one. And then the density is you know, a triangle shaped function. This means that most samples would be close to one, but you know, everything between zero and one is possible. So how do we sample from that? We could sample directly using this inverse uh, cumulative distribution function approach that we talked about last time but we want to try and apply Markov chain multi color methods here. And we set a random walk proposal. So the easiest case that we could look at um, of, of this one here. Now we have three different ways of set, setting this parameter epsilon. This is a small jump. So this means that the proposal is always very close to the current position. This is medium range. And this is you know, making, making a really large jump. What you can see here is if a proposal is very, uh, let's say conservative, so we stay close to where we started with, so we started with one half, then it wiggles around very slowly because we make very, very small steps. And almost all of the steps are accepted because they either improve the density because they you know, jump to the right, so they jump in direction of of one, so they, they all will get improved, sorry, they all will get uh, accepted, or they all make a very small step back. And a small step back means that this number here is, it's less than one because you're decreasing the, the number, but it's maybe it's 0 0.9 or 0 0.99. So still with probability 90% or 99%, you accept this step. So that means that this is why this looks very coarse because we accept almost every step. Completely different is, is this here where we make huge jumps. So for every point, we have a distribution which is you know, very broad. Now that we, um, a proposal jumps to maybe five, which is completely impossible. So this means that alpha is equal to zero. So that means that almost all proposals are completely impossible and will lead to rejection of the, the proposal. That means that we repeat the same sample over and over again, and that leads to those constant 
thesis here, where we just cannot find a suitable proposal for a very long time. Then we get one, then we jump um, you know, quite a lot, and then we are stay constant again. And somewhere in between, there's something which is uh, kind of a sweet spot because we jump around you know, sufficiently in order to explore the whole state space, but not at the cost of um, staying constant for a very long time. So this explores the state space nicely, but essentially we're just having, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't know, maybe 30 different samples from this, from this run here. And as you can see, this is the best performing one. So what, what does those orange bars mean? So this is a flipped histogram. So what you would like to have is this shape, zero, you know, this histogram, but you now flipped upside down. So you'd like to have this triangle here. And as you can see, this performs uh, best. Um, this, is, this is bad because we're not exploring this range and this range at all. So this is very only, a, very, only a, a small snapshot of the whole distribution. And this, you know, by, by the property that we are essentially keeping the same 40 samples all the time. We have gaps in between where we haven't jumped. And this is a compromise between those two settings where we jump around a lot, but you know, not, not too much. So we can still accept some samples. Okay. So this is um, apparently working because this is kind of close to this triangle shaped density, but we still have no way of knowing why this should work. So it, it might be a bit plausible to always accept samples which are better and sometimes accept samples which are worse in the sense that they increase or decrease the proposal density. But mathematically, you know, this, this is invalid. And the last thing we will do today is look at, well, look mathematically at why this recovers the correct invariant density. So now it would be a good um, a good point to ask questions about, you know, what we talked so far. If not, we will look at the correctness. No, that's the wrong one. Okay. Um, well, this is an this is a big slide. So this is just notation. Um, we start with some measure mu with density rho, which we want to sample from. And our auxiliary Markov chain has a transition kernel Q with density small q. And this alpha is this accept reject mechanism that we have talked about. Now this is, now, now it becomes, now it will become important. So, if we start at x, so we're currently at x, then we sample something y. This is of the proposal. This is sampled according to the proposal density q, small q. And this all, we also sample from this uniform number because this will allow us to, um, to accept or reject this proposal with some probability. That means that the new step, the next step, then the next sample will either be the previous one. So again, X, you know, if alpha is less than this random sum of number Z, or it's the proposal if Z is less or equal than alpha. So this is um, the mathematically compact way of those four lines in the algorithm where you, you know, sample the proposal, you sample Z, you, you know, this is a bit more compact. And this X prime is a new sample. So it's either X again, or it's a new sample, sorry, the, the proposal Y. And this allows us to write down explicitly what the transition kernel or the 
transition density, I could also write small p of x and y is. So it's a bit confusing that I called this y. That's, that's, maybe, a, that's maybe a bit bad. OK. So this, um, again, please don't um, mix those two Markov chains that we have. We have a proposal Markov chain. This is given by the transition kernel Q. And by adding this accept reject step, we modify this dynamics so we get a different Markov chain. And this we will call P. So this is proposal plus accept reject. So this is the actual Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And what is the probability that we jump from X to Y you know, in the continuous sense? So this is a density. This is either the density of the proposal. So this is sampling from the proposal. This is its density. This is multiplied by the probability that we accept this proposal. This is alpha. This is the first component. So either, so this, this dot shouldn't be here. Okay. Either we accept the proposal with probability alpha, then we are there at y, or we stay at the last sample. And now, of course, we need to have a Dirac because you know, we have a continuous part, which is a proposal, and we have a discrete part, which is staying at the, the same position. So this is why this looks very complicated, because it's a mixed distribution. It's both continuous and discrete, because the proposal is usually um, continuous, and staying somewhere is discrete. So this is why we have a density here and the Dirac delta here. OK, so what does this mean? Um, we stay at x with this probability. So this is the probability of, let's say, total rejection. Well, this sounds grim. But so what does this mean, probability of total rejection? This means um, for all possible proposals that we could do, we multiply by the probability that we reject this sample. So this is the probability of total rejection. And this here is the probability of, reject, of rejecting concretely W. So um, maybe I should explain this once again. So the transition probability from X to Y is either accepting some proposal Y with probability alpha of x and y, or it is staying at x um, with probability of all possible proposals that we could do and rejecting them. And this is given by this integral. I hope this, I hope this is clear. It takes some time getting used to. But this is the modified transition. So this part is the proposal density, and this whole thing is the transition density of our Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Uh, please stop me here because that's you know that's the most tricky part of the whole course. But, um, if I have explained this badly, please ask now. So otherwise, now we have to show that this transition density here needs to have mu as its invariant measure, or we could also write row of x here because, you know, and the dx here. So we want to have that this new Markov chain that we constructed from the proposal Markov chain plus the accept reject step has the correct invariant density. And we had some way of um, figuring out whether a Markov chain has some invariant density by checking the stronger detailed balance condition. So, um, you, you might recall that this is not, an, not a necessary step to do, but it is um, it's sufficient. So if for this Markov chain, we have the detailed balance condition with respect to the measure that we want to sample from, then this Markov chain has the correct density. And that means that you know, if it's an ergodic Markov chain, whatever that means, then we recover the correct 
density in the histograms of running a sample a long time. So if you can prove this, which is a detailed balance condition, we're done. Now, technically, we have to do some, you know, some more proper math. You know, those are difficult quantities because this is continuous and discrete. So we have to use test functions and integrate them out. So this is what we actually would have to do. Um, but we'll, I want to find um, something between something intuitive and something mathematically rigorous to, you know, so, so that it can be understood. So we start with this term here, and we want to show that this is the same as P of Y dx times mu of dy. And remember that rho is the density of mu, so this is the same thing. Now we just plug in this, this formula here, because this is the transition density, if you allow a direct, direct delta to be density. And we just multiply this by mu of dx, and then we get that. So this is the part that is from here, and mu of dx is rho of x dx. So this is a new term here, and similarly here. So the rest is just the same formula as a few slides before. Now, what is alpha? Alpha of x and y is the minimum of one and, now if we be careful, I think it's rho of y, q of y, x, divided by rho of x, q of x and y. And if we multiply this alpha by q of x, y, and rho of x, then this denominator vanishes, and it appears here, and this is what we get here. And we still have dy and dx, of course. And the second thing, we will just call, we will just call this L of x. So this, you know, there's something complicated in here. This is actually an integral, but we only care about its dependency on L is you know, some, some function of L, which is all we have to do. And what I want to show is that this quantity is symmetric with respect to you know, swapping X and Y. This is symmetric. So this is symmetric in X and Y swapping because you know minimum is symmetric with respect to its arguments. And as you can see, if you call this Y and this X, you know, then this those are symmetric terms, right? And this is symmetric because dx dy is symmetric. So the only thing that we have to check is whether this quantity here is symmetric with respect to swapping x and y. And this we can do by integration. So if we integrate twice f of x, y, which is just some, some generic function with respect to dx dy and l of x dx, and this is the same thing as the integral of f of x comma x l of x dx because this means you know this this Dirac delta means that we have to remove this integral and set y as x. So this is that, and of course this is the same thing as integral of f of y y l of y dy. Then we can do the same step back, but with you know y and x swapped. So that means that both those terms are symmetric with respect to swapping x and y. So that means that this is, you know, this is symmetric. So that means this is the same as p, p, of, um, p of y dx times mu of dy. So that means, weirdly, because of this very complicated looking accept reject step, we have constructed a Markov chain, which is in detailed balance with respect to the sample we want to, so, sorry, the measure we want to sample from. This is all because of this, this alpha here, um, because we multiplied by the right things here. And that is, I think it is just wonderful that this works. Now, 
you know, by symmetry, we have this. So we have the detailed balance condition. Now, mu was the measure we want to sample from. We have just proven that this, well, this is called the Metropolis Hastings method, what we just did. So this is the um, um, proposal plus accept reject. This fulfills the data balance condition with respect to this mu, which means that this Markov chain, you know, this, um, we have mu invariancy here. And so this is kind of a fixed point of the Markov chain. Now, given if we have a gossipicity or um, kind of contraction property, this means that samples will converge in the sense of histograms to this uh, measure. And that is all there is to know, right? So we have just con constructed a Markov chain, which will give us samples, you know, dependent samples from the, from the measure we want to sample from. Now, just a few comments for practical implementation. So the first thing is if you want to do this, you want to have acceptance probability of the proposals roughly one fourth. So um, this is supposed to be a balance between accepting all samples, but moving only very slowly and jumping huge steps, but with the price of keeping the same sample for a really long time and actually not having, no. well, this means that you only have three samples in, in effect. So this has acceptance probability close to one. This is bad. This is acceptance probability, let's say, I don't know, 10 to the minus, three probably, which is bad. And there's some theory that 0 0.23 something, I guess, uh, is uh, the best acceptance probability for Metropolis Hastings methods. So aim, aim for that. Then another thing is, it's good to not have one long chain, but try multiple shorter Markov chains. So why is that good? Let's say we have a distribution like that with two different peaks which are well disconnected. If you start maybe here, then your Markov chain will you know, go here, will try to, well, at first will improve the value very strongly, and then it will you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But it's hard to find a way back or find a way to this other peak, because yes, it will you know, go down this hill sometimes, but if they are too strongly disconnected, it's, it takes longer than the you know, age of the universe to find this other peak here. So it makes sense to start with the Markov chains you know, initialized here and maybe here and maybe here and maybe here. And then combining all those Markov chains will also give you samples here. Um, also, you should discard some number of samples in the beginning, which is called the burn in, because if you sample here, if you start here with your samples, then the first samples will be you know, the burn in um, phase. So those samples here are just transition samples and they are not representative of this distribution. So you should discard them and only, I don't know, first 10% or so of the samples should be just discarded. And by Buying all those things, you usually get a nicely performing Metropolis Hastings method. So you take many shorter Markov chains, you do some burn in discarding, and you try to optimize your proposal parameters such that the acceptance probability is neither too high nor too small. Okay, what else do you have to say? Right, so the, the, um, the last slides are don't use Monte Carlo if you have something else that you can do. Um, in one dimension, you should never do Monte Carlo, I think. Um, so for example, like we had this example before in the last session, if you want to compute pi, you can either do a Monte Carlo method, which is you know this, you enclose a ball in a box and you sample uniform distributed dots in this, in this box and you keep all the dots which are inside this, this circle then you look at the ratio of 
points inside the circle to all, all, um, to all points that you constructed, and then this you know, converges to pi four, okay? And you can also compute pi by numerically integrating you know, this circle function just because this is pi hard, right? So you can do I of those things. And as you can see, if you uh, invest more computational expenses, so if you either make the grid finer here, or if you increase the number of samples, let's assume that those two things are equally computational expensive, then this numerical quadrature is a lot better than Monte Carlo methods because but Monte Carlo doesn't converge quickly. It does not do at all. So if you can do something else, because your integration is feasible to do numerically or analytically, you should always do this numerically or analytically and never do Monte Carlo. But Monte Carlo is really good in very high dimensions. Um, if you can't do any grids because grids are too expensive and um, so why so why does Monte Carlo work? Maybe a, a sketch is in order. Obviously, I cannot draw infinite dimensions. I will do something similar in one dimension. So let's think about this function here. And think about these large areas where the density is zero as being all, you know, many dimensions. That means if you were to do some were to do something numerically or Analytically, this would be you would have to have some some kind of grid, and the grid would have to be fine in order to resolve this fine structure here, and this is computationally very demanding. But Monte Carlo methods, by the way they're constructed, they they don't visit those uh, those areas here. They try to go somewhere near the peak and they stay near the peak. So instead of having you know, a fine grid like numerical quadrature methods, they construct only samples in the region where things are interesting. That means that you use, or you discard everything here because it doesn't contribute to the integral and you use a lot of samples in some area which is interesting. That is why Monte Carlo methods work better in high dimensions or in this, you know, in settings like this where you have a high concentration because Monte Carlo methods try to pick out the regions which are interesting. But you know, if you can do something analytically or numerically, then you should definitely do that because the rate of convergence is much, much faster than Monte Carlo. So um, um, roughly, Monte Carlo always converges like one over square root of n, which is very small, very slow. And there might be even better options. So if you want to read up more on this topic, there are sparse grids. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, but essentially, so instead of making a grid like this, you know, and keeping all the grid points, you do something like point here and point here and point here and point here. And maybe something something here as well, and then a point here and point here. So you you thin out the the grid points, and only keep a lot of grid points on the axis, and that um, that is sometimes very very good way to do that. Do some so such integrations, and the other thing are quasi Monte Carlo methods. Even in one dimension, if you sample uniformly on the zero one interval. So if, that's, if you want to sample from uniform distribution and you randomly generate samples from that, you will always get clusters. So you don't get a nice, um, nice scaling, but you always get, you know, by chance, some clusters here, and this is very inefficient. So what the quasi Monte Carlo does is it randomly generates a grid, which is very regular, but it's still randomly generated. So you, tend to salvage the, the advantages of Monte Carlo methods, but you reduce this clustering here. So this is an outlook. Monte Carlo methods are not 
the best option to always do. They are usually the worst option, but sometimes you have no chance but to use Monte Carlo methods. And those two things are usually improvements on, on Monte Carlo in those cases where you have to do Monte Carlo. Okay, that concludes everything I wanted to say today. There is a lot which I haven't said, of course. Um, I hope this gave you an intuition of what Monte Carlo methods do. And I hope that if you want to learn more, then you, you know, pick up the book or you could ask questions, um, you could ask me questions, but I'm not an expert, so this might not work all the time. Um, I hope you also had some fun with that course.